Welcome to Rick Fry in Real Time. You guessed it, I'm Rick Fry. This is all brought to you by Oneness Ministries and Stream Grace Network. <laughs> oh, um, can I tell this story? Absolutely. The first time. So Mercy Me gets a hold of these truths of grace. Oh, wow. uh, they they read uh, Andrew Farley's book, uh, The Naked Gospel, and they read The Cure, our book. Mm -hmm. And suddenly we're being contacted. I get to go do a tour with them on the East Coast for 15 events. And then they ask us to go on a cruise ship and speak. I, I'd never been on a cruise ship. I didn't especially want to go on a cruise ship. but. I got on there, I was having the time of my life because I was gonna speak. It was like, wait, I'm, I'm now, people are paying extra money to come to this. Yeah. So I get up there with my very first talk, the two roads talk, and I can't hear anything because the engines are right under the stage, just rumbling. And I'm thinking nobody can hear me. It, it feels like here I am the first time and I'm failing. I'm going down in a heap as uh, the Mr. <laughs> Storyteller is bombing. In the middle of an ocean. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> These people go, are going to be with me for a week. <laughs> and then somebody, I did in the Santa Claus section of the top, somebody laughed and I went, wait, you can hear me? Oh, gosh. And it, it ended up being that very thing of them pulling for me so hard that I ended up getting a standing ovation that oh, night. And, awesome. and, and for the rest of the week, it was just in. I could tell anything because uh, we, were, we were together on that. Wow. You've kind of answered this question as well, but are there other events in your life that um, set the course mm. for this calling as a storyteller? The one about the woman in the grocery store and you acting out in the backyard. I love that. Yeah. But are there other events that sort of solidified? You know, I, I early on, I could, do, do you remember Don McLean's American Pie? Oh, yes. I, I memorized. We could probably sing the song. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, but I would memorize it uh -huh. and kind of act it out on stage at a pizza spot. And all of a sudden my peers went, wait, wait, Dude, you do this, and I, I did this, I used to have this skill of being able to fake like I was going up and down the radio dial, doing different stations, like one in Kansas that's barely coming in in a basketball game, and then a, a Spanish dry cleaners and a, a, a commercial, and I would go, and people everywhere I would go said, do that radio dial thing, you know, funny guy, yeah. and, and <laughs> so I was known as that guy. Yeah. And uh, and I loved it, it yeah. but it it was Rick. It was terrifying to me, the the thought of failing mm -hmm. at that and embarrassing myself, which I did. Uh, that that still today, if you if you ask what what do I strive? I think every time I'm getting up to speak, right before it, I'm thinking. I could have been an electrician. I should have been. I should have gone <laughs> should have into a, electrical work. I should have been a dentist. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so, but but many many places along the way, I got to act out things and see them work, yeah. and it gave me the confidence to believe. Wait, I can do this. I it, it, think about it. We were in with this little company, Sharky Productions. And we wrote plays. Our advantage was we knew who we had as actors and actresses. And so we would write plays that went on down at the Herberger. And that was a dream of my life, was to get to tell those stories and have them come alive uh, and have a faith component of reality in them, of, of a way that somebody... Our dream was always that someone who who didn't believe God was real, would come one night 
and then ask their non-believing friend the next night. And that, that was our dream of what, was lo what would, it, would look like. Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, it, this is just making me think of something else. Do you know the group, The Lost Dogs? They're, they're a band from way, way back. I don't remember. Oh gosh, what I love about them is they, they put themselves in the boat with everybody else. So there's everybody, strong, weak, uh, wealthy, put together with the criminals. He puts us all in the same boat in his, their songs. I'm, I love it. I'm so proud of them. If I was a songwriter, I would like to be able to write songs like they did. Uh, I don't know if they're together anymore, but that's how I want to speak. I want to get everybody in the same boat. I, I, don't, I don't want to be preaching at an enemy. I don't want to be focusing on what do I not like. I, I want us to experience. I, I always say if I could somehow get us in a Adirondack chair with a mint julep in our hand and I could see the love of Christ, I could somehow present the love of Christ and who you are, that you're this new creature, not this loathsome failure. If I could get us to, to just see it visually, I don't know how, but that it would change the way we do everything. You know what I just saw? That God doesn't have a throne. He has a matter on that. <sighs> absolutely. And he With serves mint a julep. mean <laughs> mint julep. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's got the little, you know, umbrella straw to it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he does. Yep. Yeah, he does. The young John Lynch had a dream of becoming a professional athlete. <sighs> yeah. Um, how has that impacted you? your ability and willingness to dream. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I tell the story in On My Worst Day. Yeah. I, I was a really good high school pitcher. I'd worked at it so hard. We had a wall when I was back in Upland that I could throw a tennis ball at for hours a day. And, and whenever my dad and I get in an argument, I just grab my glove and my tennis ball and, and just, you just learn how to catch a ball and how to throw a ball. By the time I got in high school, my senior year, I threw two no-hitters, a couple of one-hitters, a two-hitter, a three-hitter, and I, I was striking out two batters in the inning. Mm -hmm. And I was left-handed, so I was picking off whoever I walked, because I walked a lot of guys. Um, and I made the All-State team. And I remember <clears throat> all I wanted to do was be drafted. I wanted to be on those bus rides, like from Bull Durham, you know, just yes. those those A-League towns where it's just, people are making fires out in the bullpen, <laughs> keep their feet warm, and I just wanted, just let me do that for a season or two. That's, I want to make minimum wage. I just yep. want to pitch down in, you know, Copper State, Florida. Uh, and so that night at the All-Star Game, uh, I pitched really well. Two innings, didn't allow anything. Uh, I don't know how many I struck out. And, and it was the first year where the, the scouts had the, those uh, guns, those radar guns, oh, the speed yeah. guns speed to guns, be able yeah. to tell faster <clears throat> pitching. I, I was overwhelmed. We were down to the Cleveland Indians stadium, their, their, their uh, spring training stadium. And after the game, a scout came up to me. And he, uh, on this team also, on that game, was Johnny Pearson. Mm -hmm. And Johnny was a second baseman, and he became All-State also. And Johnny and I were good friends until he stole my girlfriend. And uh, so at that time of the All-State game, he's with my girlfriend. All that to tell you, the scout said, John, you pitched you played really, really, really well tonight, and we're gonna draft you. And just keep your nose clean. It's gonna be in a couple of weeks, the draft, and we're not exactly sure where we're gonna take you yet, but we for sure are gonna take you. And I'm there, I'm there with my dad, I'm there with these 
friends, and I'm, I, I go, life can't be any better than this. Yes, yes, thank you very much, and I'll keep my nose clean. He said, okay, Johnny Pearson, we'll see you in a little bit. Right. <laughs> and I, I said, excuse me? He said, Johnny Pearson. I said, no, 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 I'm John Lynch. Um, he said, oh, <laughs> I feel so stupid. Could you direct me to Johnny Pearson? And I, so here I am pointing over there directing this scout to this man that I hate with all my heart. And uh, I got to pitch a little longer. I blew out my arm and I pitched at Arizona State with Bobby Winkles. Just wanted to be there with Bobby Winkles. And uh, I took one yard deep. Uh, one time I got to play and Winkles put me in the outfield because I hit it, hit a home run. I immediately misjudged a fly ball and that was the end of that. But, <laughs> but I, I never got to pitch at that level that I wanted to pitch at. And that's all I wanted to be all my life was a professional. I listened to Koufax, I, I saw Koufax pitch. I listened to Vince Scully call his no hitter against Chicago. I, that's all I wanted to be, all I wanted to be. And so I didn't know who I was. My girlfriend has left me and baseball has gone away from me. And I was just this straight kid. I had, I don't think I'd had two beers. And if I had them, they were with Jim Adams' mom, you know. It, it, I, and suddenly I gave up the straight life and it sent me on a journey of broken-hearted lostness, of wandering, of just wanting life to end. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, I, I, to have someone, I always talk about shame. Guilt says you've done something wrong. Shame says there's something uniquely wrong about who you right. are. And something about this girl, the homecoming queen, knowing me well for years, knowing the secrets of my heart and then leaving, who can come back from that? Yeah. How do you, how do you, and, and so I, not because I had any worldview of anything, I just started doing every drug I could get my hands on. I stopped playing baseball, I wandered around the country, I had wrong relationships with women. It affected me so deeply. I just said, whatever that life was, it didn't work. And I don't know who I am now. I, I lived that way for a long time. When did you get it back? Hmm. Started teaching school. Uh, uh, I got my certification and I was teaching high school drama and English. Mm. Oh man, gosh, was that a delight. But these kids, I didn't know, I, I cast a play uh, in drama and the kids, two thirds of the kids in the, the the cast were young life kids. And they would talk to me after rehearsal about Jesus. I would no more have let you do that than fly, but they were kids. What damage could they do? <laughs> and, and, and then somebody gave me a Keith Green album. And, uh, and then someone gave me a Bob Dylan Slow Train Coming album. And I thought, if Dylan is come to faith in Jesus. I, I gotta get on this thing. The do boat door's about to close. I mean, come on. <laughs> but um, the best way I knew how, I said, Jesus, I have run from you all my life. I have hid from you. My dad was a, a Mensa atheist. We didn't talk about God. We just, and I just thought religion was the opiate of the masses. I just thought it was, Sometimes it can be. Uh, at its worst, it is the opiate of the masses. Yes. And, but I just thought they were an inferior. I just actually, when I prayed, I said, "Please don't make me one of those people with the bolo ties, with the. Don't make me one. Don't make me weird. But if you want to, I'm okay with yeah. it." And I just said, "Jesus, if you'll have me, I need you." I'm desperate. Mm. I'm, I'm going down. Mm. And, wow. and I somehow have found myself 
coming to believe that you're real. And so that was asked in my heart, trusted that he was the son of God and that he loved me. Wow. And for seven days, every day I'd wake up, I'd, I'd, I'd call his name by a different biblical name just to make sure it took. You know, I, I, <laughs> I wasn't sure it took. So, but eventually I actually believed that it took. I, I'm answering every question you've ever had in, in 15 minutes. Oh, yeah, we're, yeah. yeah. Um, I'll just repeat them. I'll just ask the same question. <laughs> this is a hard question for me because, well, I'll just ask it and then I'll say why. Many of us have been sexually abused. Yeah, gosh. And often it's the secret. The secret is just as damaging as the assault. That's, those are powerful words. Those are powerful words what you just said yeah. what what is caused by the event cr can create a secret mm -hmm. that can haunt you that can, the, the, the hiddenness of that and the posturing of that sorry I'm no that, that, that was so well said my assault wasn't sexual but it was very physical and very abusive who mm. almost makes me want to mm. cry mm. Um, <clears throat> what stories have come from that experience for you? Yeah. And it's we know about it from your book on my yeah. worst day. Yeah, and and I'm going to say something that we said before we started filming. This is one of the reasons why I love coming on your show. This is one of the reasons I trust you. Is what you just did mm. involuntarily. I know you're for real. I know you're not showing me some fake. Thank you. Thing. Thank you. Because it. That's a, so you're stuck with me, <laughs> as, I, as I said. Um, well, the, the bad part of that is that you're kind of stuck with me. Yeah. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm very, very happy about that, and I, I, I know what that means, and I'm very happy with that. Um, I was. I was just this innocent kid. Innocent is. I just didn't know much about life, and. I'm in fifth grade and I'm popular and I'm funny or, and this tough kid, uh, he, he one day, he doesn't beat me up. He beats up people, but he never beats me up because I'm funny to him. Mm. And one day he says, uh, Lynch, we're going to meet down at the railroad tracks on Saturday. He didn't ask me. He just said, we are. And, uh, so you'd be there at, uh, like, like eight in the morning, and I did. I got there, and we walked down the tracks, and at, at the end of the tracks, down near the center of town were these rail cars that were filled with oranges, about to be sent off all over the country. And the kids during the week, we would get in there and eat oranges. Nobody had scurvy in our town, man. We <laughs> just would pound oranges. But on the weekend, kids weren't there. And I just, I just immediately got up in, like we always had, climbed up that ladder, that train car, and I got into the, the car with the oranges, and then he got in after me. And I still can hear the sound of that iron, steel, great grinding to close out all sunlight. And I got afraid. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't get out. He was stronger and more violent. He and he proceeded to tell me what he was going to do to me sexually and what I'd be doing to him. And that is all a blur now and it happened. What he said was going to happen happened. And I I, I my next memory is being out of the tr yeah. Being out of the train car and 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 basically thinking, I, there's no one I can tell this to. There's absolutely no one I can tell this to. I'm not going to tell it to my parents. You know what? If I just if I just don't think about it, it'll go away. And that didn't happen. And I tried it. Nobody ever heard about what happened uh, all through junior high all through high school, all through college, all through my wandering years, when I came to Jesus, when I got married, 
we wrote True Face, the book, mm -hmm. and no one knew. I thought if you knew, uh, you would pity me. Mm -hmm. You'd be ashamed of me. I thought if anyone in True Face knew, I would lose my job. Mm -hmm. I felt that Stacy for sure would be so violated and she would leave me. And I just thought, I can go through my life. I had no idea how damaging that would be to me. Uh, I, I, I can't tell you how old I was. It was after we wrote True Face that one day it blurted out. We were doing a conference, Bill, Bruce, and I, and Bill Thrall, still my big brother in the faith. We were out somewhere in Seattle, and we were walking the streets. We had a 15-minute break, and I blurted out, Bill, I got to tell you about what happened in the boxcars when I was in fifth grade. And I did, and I thought, okay, I'm, I'm ready. Bring what may. I lose my job, lose my friendship. I, I, at least it's out. Yeah. It, it felt so good to have it out into the air, saying yeah. words. I'd almost said it one time before, but this time I said it. And I just was so underwhelmed with his response. He said, oh, it's how that breaks my heart. I didn't know that, and I'm so sorry. And whatever I can do to stand with you, I will. Now we got to get back into the session. Uh, we got about two minutes. Let's go. <laughs> All right, well, that's it. And then I went home, and I, I told Stacy, And she said, oh, this breaks my heart. I'll stand with you, my dear husband. Uh, what do you want for dinner? Uh, I just need to think about that for a second. I went, what do I want for dinner? I just told you. And she says, I know. It's okay. I got you. I love you. I even love you more. Ah, it's... So, so now I can't stop telling it because I go, every men's conference I go to, I'm presuming a good portion of them are hiding something sexual, abusive, that they can't tell, and they don't, they don't know how to tell. Yeah. And they think they'll be destroyed if they tell. Yeah. So I love getting to tell that story every time I go out. And, and, and for some reason, that's over half of where I go is men's conferences. Hmm. So it's a- That's awesome. Yeah, real privilege. Yeah, yeah. awesome. Well, the sad part is that the secret becomes normal. And so you can't break normal, because then there's nothing to replace it with. <sighs> yeah, I hate what you just said. Yeah, yeah, because it's true. It's it's. I would, I would, speak at a camp, a family camp up at Horn Creek, and and you know, I would drive around the park lot when we got there, and Stacy said, "Would you just park? What are you doing?" And I said, and inside I'm thinking. I am still get to just be John Lynch right now. I'm about to be a phony for a week because nobody can know. Mm. And, and I'm going to have to act for a week. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> yeah, that's right, Tiger. Woo, yeah. <laughs> you you want to talk about it? Sure, I'll counsel you guys. And, and I'm carrying this hidden thing that is that has taught me how to be fake and put on a mask and not be known. I think that's, you write to the things you struggle with most, and that's why we talk so much about not wearing masks and being authentic and, and letting your story be told and um, having trusted places where the worst of you can be known to discover that you'll be loved more, not less, in the telling of it. Thank you.